is March 7th, 2011. I'm here with Tom O'Neill and Alice Anderson from Passages Incorporated. My name is Deb Lawrence, and I'm working for the Peabody Public Library Oral History Program. Thank you for being here today. Thank you. Um, what we would like to know is pretty much what is Passages? How did it start? Where has it come from there? Let me maybe start with a little bit of, of what I consider the, the contemporary intellectual developmental disability movement. It really started in the early 1940s and really began to pick up speed in the mid-40s as World War II was drawing to an end. And, and prior to that time, prior to the end of the 40s, beginning of the 1950s, if a family had a son or a daughter with a with a lifetime intellectual and developmental disability, the likelihood was is that that person would probably, at least by the age of six or seven, be placed in a state institution where he or she would, in all likelihood, spend the rest of their life. And in the late 40s, and there's a lot of parallels that exist here between the intellectual disability movement and the civil rights movement in terms of people saying, we want to look at things in a little different kind of a way and we're going to do things differently. And it was really families in the mid-40s, early 1950s that said, we're going to take our sons and daughters home. And this was frequently against the advice sometimes of other family members, against the advice of physicians, against the advice maybe somebody was affiliated with a religious organization, a minister, a priest, a rabbi, whatever it may have been. But parents started saying, no, we're going to try things a little bit differently. There was very little in terms of law or public policy to support what parents were doing at that time. But parents, these were really some, I think, incredibly heroic people who defied all odds and took their sons or daughters home. Um, as we sit here today, there's a quote I'm trying to think of, and it's, um, you know, if we can see, in the, and I'm going to paraphrase it a little bit, but if we can see in the distance, it's because of the, the, the tall shoulders that we stand upon. And those are really the people who, who I think were the pioneers of where we are today. So now, those, those institutions that these people were put into, mm -hmm. they weren't around here, though, were they? Oh, they were. They were. But, I mean, not in Columbia City. Not in Columbia City, but around here. You would here. have to drive... Fort Wayne. Yeah. There was a huge institution in Fort Wayne. And um, uh, it was a very imposing, looked like the old building. I remember before the record ball had mm -hmm. it, it looked kind of like something out of an Edgar Allan Poe movie or something, just kind of a very sterile kind of a place. Drive into Logansport, Indiana today, and you can still see the, the campus of, of one of those institutions. In Indiana, those institutions are just about totally closed. There's one in Madison, Indiana today, I think that has 230, 240 residents, but most of them have been closed in Indiana, as most of them have been across the country. But this large movement really started in the, in the mid-40s into 1950. Passages started in 1954. And it was really a dozen families who got together from this area and said, we want to look for an opportunity to educate our sons and our daughters with lifetime disabilities at home in a different kind of way than's happened in the past. There was no public law that mandated an education for people with, in Indiana, for people with lifetime disabilities at that time. And so the parents got together, and I don't remember the first name that Passages was. It was Opportunity Center. Opportunity Center? Okay. And that's when parents, these 12 parents started doing this with very little funding, um, but uh, strong will, strong desire, strong motivation, great deal of tenacity, and uh, started pulling this together. And it was the same time you could go from New York to California, from Wisconsin to Texas. And it was the same time that this same type of movement was taking place in other parts of the country. And in Columbia City, Whitley County was doing the, the same kind of things. In the following years, in the 60s and into the 70s, there was some change in public law that uh, really got this focus in a different area. And there was money that started to come into the programs. And there were changes with some of that funding, that also public policy and funding, that took place following some of this. But it was those pioneer parents in the mid-1950s that really got us going. Do you yeah. want to maybe? Sure. This is a good time for me to jump in because um, I started my career in the 70s. And that was when I came out of graduate school um, from college and with a degree in special education. And I came in at a time when services were just beginning to come into the community for people with disabilities. And I was fortunate enough to 
I'm, I'm, I'm a hometown girl. I, I live in South Whitley. I grew up there, so I'm a. Uh, this is where my heart is here in Whitley County, and um, I can remember uh, working here. Um, I started at Cardinal Center and then moved up, came over here uh, in the preschool program and began my career here. Um, passages at that time but it was just shortly after I started here within two or three years that the state began to free up some dollars some training dollars and it started to flow to all providers in Indiana uh, as these folks started coming out of institutions into the community you know we had the opportunity to begin serving people with disabilities here and I can remember being part of program development and the excitement that we had um, at that time in terms of developing programs and that those were the years that we uh, opened up group homes in Columbia City. We operate three group homes here. Um, they were originally opened during that time period this, in the 80s, early 80s. Uh, employment services, we began to provide job placement um, along with some work adjustment. Uh, the voc vocational rehabilitation money was uh, rich with flowing through to communities to provide some job training supports for individuals with disability with intellectual disabilities uh, we had uh, began teaching academic daily living skills classes for people with, uh, with that came to passages so so you're showing them how to cook their dinner you're showing them how to wash their clothes right. how to the practical skills of living as an adult in the in their homes or in their community, uh, banking, um, uh, how to uh, read a menu, how to put uh, prepare a, meals in a kitchen, uh, all those kinds of things we began teaching here, not here, but at, at the Opportunity Center. We were still called the Opportunity Center at that time. And where was that located? That was on uh, 445 South Line Street. Okay. Yeah. That was where we had their sheltered workshop and where we, our programs really began to develop at that location. Um, we had um, began some infant services and some homebound services during this time. I remember going out and doing adult homebound services to adults mm -hmm. that were uh, not quite ready maybe to come into the program, but there was money for that, for us to do home visits with adults with, uh, with intellectual disabilities. Um, Infant services uh, were agency-based at that time. We had a preschool program with for young children uh, that came, um, and there was a teacher, and we were teaching daily or developmental activities for young children. Uh, also with an infant homebound program, we were doing some in, in, infant homebound services. Um, as, as the years went on, I believe it was like the late 1880s, maybe early 1990s, we started to see some um, changes happen with residential services. Uh, people were, were uh, given what they call Medicaid waivers, and that means that instead of living in a group home or a more restrictive setting, they could have a Medicaid waiver which would waive a lot of those regulations and they could begin living in the community in small homes, uh, one or two uh, housemates, or on their own. So there are lots of opportunities for people to begin living more engaged in community life during these years. And we, our um, supported living program began to really grow uh, in Columbia City. And we began to see folks moving from group homes and their own private homes out into their own apartment or their own homes in the community. Uh, day services, um, workshop, paid pro, pr uh, paid work has always been it's been available for our folks. Um, during these years, uh, we saw um, lucrative subcontract work from local and uh, manufacturing companies, as well as uh, development of community activities, uh, which were community-based activities in the. Uh, for people uh, with intellectual disabilities to participate in volunteer pro activities, um, recreational activities in the program. So we were beginning to take people from the, the segregated day program out into the community and offer some um, uh, opportunities to be part of mm -hmm. the community. Now, when 
when you say the manufacturing, is that Tower View Industries? Right now it is, yes. And, and what is Tower View Industries? Tower View Industries is, is the current location for our day services, for our individuals who uh, live in the community or group homes or supported living come during the Monday through Friday for, for training activities as well as paid work. We do have subcontract, what we call subcontract work for manufacturers that uh, clients can earn paychecks by, by completing the work at Tower View Industries. Very good. <sighs> Very short history. <laughs> so, um, I was talking with Tom earlier, you used to have um, some secondhand shops mm -hmm. when the Opportunity Center was around. I know there was one on Main Street by the bowling alley, and then mm -hmm. it moved out to McDonald's. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was one uptown. I think they there was uptown. one uptown as well. Fox, yeah, Fox's department mm -hmm. store. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that just didn't go as well as. Uh, yeah, I I think we were having trouble uh, at well, at one point paying the bills. Uh, it wasn't uh, cash flow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, on a on a typical day. I realize there are no typical days, <laughs> but on a typical day, what will one of your clients, when they get up, then they go to work? Mm -hmm. They Typically, people just like we do. Uh, we uh, get up in the morning and, and uh, get dressed and have a breakfast and uh, leave to go to work or um, we have a senior program at the Cluxton Center here in Columbia City where, where folks might, rather than wanting to work, they would just soon do retirement activities. So that group might go for some senior club coffee mm -hmm. and, and some time with friends. Or other folks might come to the Tower View location and receive training and paid work, uh, some activities during the daytime. Some people have community jobs. They get up in the morning and that day they have some uh, paid or an employment opportunity if they have a job in the community mm -hmm. with a job coach. So depending on, you know, what your day is, you would, you would go about your day similar to what you or I would do uh, in our day. Coming home um, at the end of the day and relaxing a little bit and, and preparing supper and relaxing with your housemates or have an activity in the evening. Um, get ready to go to bed and start over. Sounds like me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Now, how many group homes do you have now? Three. We three? Have three uh, group homes. Mm -hmm. Two of them are all male mm -hmm. and one is female. And there are eight, uh, we're licensed for eight in each of the group homes. Mm -hmm. And we've had 100% occupancy or close to 100% occupancy for, I know, the last couple of years that I've been here. And you know, it, it, it's interesting as Alice was talking. And I was thinking of typical, if there is such a creature right. with any of us. Um, but what, what the government was finding out, and, and what policymakers were finding out, and certainly what families knew, and that was that given the opportunity to, to see how far somebody could go in their life, is, is what really the group homes and the waiver homes were really doing. And waiver, it's kind of interesting, and, and the word that, or the person that really captured it was Ronald Reagan. And he was doing a press conference or something. I don't remember what the circumstances were. And a family caught here. He, a family caught his attention, and they had a son or a daughter who needed services outside of the regular service system that was there. And bureaucracies aren't always built to be real flexible with people. And um, and Reagan was not a great bureaucrat necessarily. And uh, the family said that they needed these other services instead. And the idea was really, as Alice was talking about it, but was to, to waive the requirement that was there and put somebody in, a, in another situation. In 1975, a public law was passed, which I think probably will, will go down in history as one of the most salient pieces of legislation and policy for people with intellectual disabilities from the last century. The public law is 94-142, and when the law was passed, it was called uh, educate, Education... So the idea... It's IDEA Today, which is Individuals with yeah. Disabilities Education Act, but it was it had a different name in yeah. '75 when it was passed, and it's been reauthorized by Congress every five years since then. But the idea of that was 
of that public law in the schools was one to mandate on a federal level that all kids with special needs, regardless of where they fit in that spectrum, would have the opportunity to be educated in a least restrictive environment. And if that environment meant integration into regular classroom, but it really that's what really started to do away with the quote special schools in Indiana, where kids today are educated much more so in their neighborhood <coughs> schools than they were before. An incredibly important piece, but then that same thinking also went into the group homes, went into the waiver homes, mm -hmm. and all other pieces. And the services that we provide for people today, there's a myriad of services. So when you're asking about typical, there are some people who we provide a few hours of support per week because that's what they need. There are other people who are providing services 24/7, 365, depending upon their need. So it's really a, a wide variety. So, so you have much more. Of a, of a waiver home in Whitley County, I mean much more, many more waiver homes than you have actual group homes? Mm -hmm. Correct. More people served, yeah. And some of those folks live by themselves, mm -hmm. some of them live with two or three roommates, some, some of them have lived with a family, their own family, their natural mm -hmm. family, just depending upon the, uh, the circumstances. Very good. Um, other than, than the training, and, and working, do you have other special activities? Are you um, active in Special Olympics, or I mean, do you help with that, or is that the family that does that? Or Special Olympics has not been real active here in Whitley County for for a while that I'm aware. Of. One of the programs maybe Alice can talk about a little bit that I think is really exciting is our art program mm -hmm. and what's happened there in the last couple of years and what we're doing. With that. Know, we've had displays at the library. Yeah. Yes, we have some right. very talented yeah. people. Very and, we, talented. And, and that was, we kind of fell into that by accident. A young woman from the community came in just wanted to volunteer. And in the course of that conversation and some of her, trying to match her skills with some of the, uh, well, what I thought might be beneficial for the clients as well, uh, she disclosed that she was an artist. And that was one of my dreams, is to get an art program going, the day program. And she's done a wonderful job of getting the, fo getting the folks involved and engaged in various forms of art. And people that I never would have dreamed that w didn't communicate <laughs> and uh, were beginning to communicate through their artwork. It was just an, a beautiful and amazing thing to see some people begin to open up through that. So we're real excited about the program and, you know, really are hoping to build on this and mm -hmm. move it forward and, and um, make it a real core part of, of what we Is that something they do here in this building or does this over lady... The, typically over the Tower View building. Ah, okay. So the art program is located. Okay. We're having an event this March 17th. It's called Passages Presents Paintings, Pickles, and Patrick. I saw that on Talk of the Town. And um, it, the, the paintings is the artwork of our clients. Pickles is the restaurant in, uh, that is between Columbia City and uh, Fort Wayne. Mm -hmm. And Patrick is March 17th, St. Patrick's Day. And uh, we're really excited about that. We'd really like to grow that program. We'd like to get photography in there. We've talked mm -hmm. about ceramics in there. But to provide different mediums for people. And I'm going to jump on what Alice said, and, and you know, I can't say enough about people that didn't have the ability to communicate in one way are finding a, an ability to communicate through expressing themselves in some type of art. We have what the Fort Wayne Dance Collective is starting yes. a program mm -hmm. with us this summer, this summer mm -hmm. which is kind of bodily expression, mm -hmm. and again, but looking at ways for the people who we serve to be able to, to enjoy and appreciate it. And the sense of pride that we see in, in some of our clients is just mm -hmm. incredible in terms of their artwork and what they're doing. So we're, we're excited about that. Very exciting. Um, I see you just bought the Lemberg building. We did. And we'll be, we'll be moving these offices there. We, we have a meeting, in fact, a week from tomorrow, tomorrow morning, um, Alice and I and our CFO with uh, an architectural firm out of Fort Wayne that's doing some pro bono work with us and uh, beginning to look at the building and how we really design it. But yeah, we, we will be there, but how we use the 20,000 square feet that are there is kind of to be determined yet mm -hmm. as we move through the next few months. We'll be here as it stands right now, as of March 7th anyway, 2011. We'll be here through probably at least the end of November. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it's an exciting time. It's a very challenging time. 
um, you know, as the economy has been challenged in the last couple of years, you know, we have certainly felt that and continue to feel it here. We've had, um, you know, cuts from the state in the 3 to 7 percent range and some program cuts and elimination. So we're adjusting to a different world. And it, it's kind of interesting to me. If you look back at public, again, I'm going to go back to public law 94, 142 in 1975 and all the changes that, that we are experiencing, have experienced, and continue to experience. But today we have the most integrated, educated group of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities that society has ever had. But those people who had the benefit of Public Law 94-142, and at this point that would be 36 years ago, are now really into adulthood. And it's kind of these changes in services for adults, and how do we, Passage is one of the service providers in this arena, you know, how, how do we provide for that, those, those changes that are there? And the, the clients who we serve, if, if you think of somebody who's, quote, normal, if there is such a creature as normal, mm. <laughs> we'll, we can debate that one. <laughs> but IQ range is usually 90 to 110. And if you think of somebody who has intellectual or developmental challenges, it's 89 and below. So if 90 to 110 is this big, 89 and below is this big. So it, it's not one size fits all for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. There's incredible variance in terms of the needs of people and how they can function. But um, I, I think the, 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 the biggest challenge that, that's there is how we give people with intellectual and developmental disabilities the opportunity to see who they are and to see how they can fit in to a spectrum. I have a son with Down syndrome who will be 33 years old this summer. And a number of years ago, an educator made the comment to my wife and me that people with Down syndrome can't read. And my son, our son was about two and a half, three years old at that time. And I said, I don't know if he can or he can't. I said, but I think the issue is we see whether or not we give him the opportunity to see whether or not he can or he can't. And if he can't, that's okay. But it's not okay if we haven't given him the opportunity right. to see if he can read. And he can read. He's not going to read War and Peace, but neither am I. And, uh, and I'm a pretty voracious reader. Um, but it's, it's a matter of opportunity. And kind of outside of Whitley County and Columbia City a little bit, but I, I think when one thinks of the, the, this movement, intellectual developmental disabilities movement from the last you know, 60 years or so, uh, there have been some incredibly significant people who've been part of it. And good public policy for people with disabilities is bipartisan policy. Uh, it's not democratic policy, it's not Republican policy. And in the, in, the last couple, in the last couple of years, we lost some of our great advocates at the national level. Eunice Kennedy was an incredible advocate. And um, um, she never sat in a seat in Congress, in either House of Congress, but she certainly impacted what Congress did for a long time. Special Olympics was huge. Um, but that, that was a loss, and that's a void that, that hasn't been filled yet. Hopefully it will be, but we need those advocates in Indianapolis and in Washington, D.C., both. We also, if we can go into another piece of who we are for just a mm -hmm, second. Sure. And I think it was 1997, um, through the efforts of Passages, another corporation was formed, and that's the Whitley Crossing Neighborhood Corporation, and that's affordable housing. And that, one of the parts of that mission in establishing Whitley Crossing was really to have housing for for the people who we serve here, good affordable housing. Whitley Crossing is, is affordable housing, which is low moderate income housing. And we've successfully done three projects in, in Columbia City with the Clarkson Hotel, which is downtown Columbia City, which is an old piece of Columbia sure. City history going back 100 years ago. Um, we have uh, 22 units in that for seniors, 55 and older. Um, we have 22 units in an apartment complex called Whitley Meadows, which is here in Columbia City, and then 21 single-family homes that are heritage place that we do. And all of these provide uh, some housing opportunity for the people served by passages, as well as other people in the community who are in need of affordable housing. And a couple of the greatest needs that people with disabilities have is social opportunities, job and housing. I mean, those are, are crucial links. Transportation is certainly one of those also. But being able to be a part of the community and giving people that opportunity and housing is a piece of it. Sure. You mentioned social opportunities. Do, do we have planned social gatherings? 
Yeah, some of them are planned. We, you know, folks like to have Halloween parties, Christmas parties, and uh, we usually have a location off-site here in the community, um, such as the Eagles. We've used the, the Eagles have been kind enough to um, offer us some space for some of our parties. But uh, there, there's planned recreational activities in the community as well as individual with a staff person and, and, a, and a client going just together to go volunteer or to uh, we do some work with the, um, the hospital Meals on Wheels and we do uh, some mail delivery there at the hospital. Uh, we also are very much involved in the, in the Harvest Food Bank um, locally as well as uh, you connecting with the Fort Wayne to, uh, to bring uh, food items back to Whitley County. So our folks are very heavily involved in giving now, giving back to the community um, some of their um, their abilities and, and so and we can support them and, and giving back to the community. One of the things we could mention it would be the rest areas. You know, we, mm -hmm. we did, uh, yeah. I don't really have a good time frame and it's been several years ago we, we began uh, getting, we got contracts with the state to operate the rest areas um, mm -hmm. on 69, right? There are two, yeah, the are actually I think three on 69 that Passage has had at one point. Two south of Fort Wayne, one north of Fort Wayne, and then two on 30 just west of Fort Wayne. One on the north, one on the south side of Highway 30. And those two closed just before I came here, so two right. and a half years ago roughly. So we have the one yet. We have one. We have the one. So it's been an opportunity for our, our folks to work. You know, and and you staff the. Yes. 24 mm 7. -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. So there were a lot of jobs there at one time. Sure. Now the, um, the state has changed how frequently they they placed rest areas mm -hmm. now, and there I don't think there are any on roads like 30 anymore. I think so. And um, but there will be another one that we will have a good opportunity with that will be built be north of Fort Wayne, south of Auburn, in that area that we will have a good opportunity to bid on when, when it opens. Now, when when you place folks in these particular Jobs? Do you provide the transportation? Mm -hmm. Do they have to? Well, we we like to uh, encourage self-support as much mm -hmm. as possible. So we would first thing we'd like to do is to find is there another is there a support system in that person's life that can provide the transportation? If not, we can do that. Um, but yeah, we can provide that. We can we provide the on-site job coaching until the person learns the job. So the supports that we provide help the individual to get to the job and as well as work, um, work there or as needed. Uh, some folks need a lot of job coaching and some people just need us to stop by once or twice a week and see how things are going. So. And what we really like to do, and maybe you can chime in on this too, Alice, but that is to kind of um, challenge people to see how far they can go to be able to do it rather than people just becoming totally dependent on us. That, that, that's not healthy for them and it's not good programming for us to do that. Right. That's exactly right. All right. Okay. Well, any other history that you would like to pass along or? One of the things I, that I'm going to take just a second comment on, and that is, and having been part of the disability community for, for over 30 years, one of the big changes that I see, have seen, continue to see today more so, and that is that people with disabilities speaking for themselves. And um, it, today it's referred to as the self-advocacy movement, but that is whether somebody is physically challenged, intellectually, cognitively, whatever the issue may be, but people want to be their own voice and they don't want others speaking for them. They want to speak their own position. And we certainly see that with people with intellectual disabilities. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a good, healthy kind of a, an evolution that's mm -hmm. taken place over time. One time it was parents and family or other loved ones or service providers that did that. And the people with disabilities said, that's all well and good. We can talk too and, and we have voices. There's a national organization called uh, SAVE, which is the Self Advocates Becoming Empowered, which is, there's a uh, uh, Indiana chapter and uh, it's very forceful. And uh, they're doing advocating in Indianapolis and they're doing advocating in Washington, D.C and they're cornering legislators just like other people are to talk about who they are and what their needs are. 
So I, I think it's, it's, it's the healthy kinds of things. Sometimes on a day-to-day -day basis, you don't see all the changes that have taken place, but you know, right. you've been around three decades, and when you, you step bet. back in three decades and, and take a look in, you can say, you know, there, there really have been a lot of changes. And, um, and it's not going back. You know, sometimes it's two steps forward and mm -hmm. one step back, or maybe three steps back and four steps forward. But there is a movement, and there's a momentum that gets there today. And the, the internet is a huge piece of oh, that. Sure. And you can go on the internet and get all kinds of inaccurate information, and you can go on the internet and get all kinds of accurate information. It's a matter of kind of fanning out mm -hmm. and finding uh, good, good sources. Sure. But Passages has been here for a long time, and uh, it's been an integral part of the community. And one of the things I've certainly learned in the last couple of years that I've been here, and that is that the, the community really regards and embraces Passages as part of the community. And that became very clear to me very quickly. Do you remember any obstacles, like 30 years ago, were there, were there, were there people that didn't want you here? Oh, or has sure. this com community yeah, yeah. always been as great as they are it's, right now? It's taken a lot of <clears throat> education, mm -hmm. and um, if, you know, it's certainly I think compared to where we were back in the early, when we were just beginning to open up group homes, there was resistance at some, at some level. Um, as we became neighbors and moved, as we moved mm -hmm. in and became neighbors, that attitude began to change a little bit. So we had to go out, be out in the community and demonstrate that we can be good citizens of Columbia City and good neighbors. But yeah, sure. And I still today, not not as frequently as it, as it was years ago, but I've run into um, kind of a, a resistance with an attitude. And it surprises me sometimes because I'm so used to these are folks, these are people just like you and me, and then I run into the attitude and, whoop, you know, we got to do some education in here a little bit. But sure, I think it's just uh, pretty typical in, in any community. Mm -hmm. but I, I would think over the years, as this community has opened up their arms in general and been very acceptive and um, um, open, you know, to folks that uh, we serve here. The words we use today were intellectual disability. And if this conversation was taking place five years ago, the word we probably would have used would have been mental retardation. Yes. Mm -hmm. And last October, and I think it was October 6th, President Obama signed a piece of legislation called Rosa's Law, R-O-S-A, Rosa's Law. Rosa was a young lady in, uh, from Maryland. And um, through some efforts with, actually starting with Rosa and her brother, younger brother, um, the, the uh, Maryland legislature passed a piece of legislation to do away with the word mental retardation. And not that the word itself was bad, but it was the connotation that came with the word and the word retard that came with it, which is a very sensitive issue. I thought of it when Alice was speaking here a minute ago. And um, and not in, in Rosa's law that was signed last October, in the federal lexicon, the words mental retardation are no longer used. It's intellectual and or developmental disability. And that's part of our crusade also is educating people in terms of who people with intellectual disabilities are, and the fact that they're really, as Alice, I think, just said very well, they're like everybody else, mm -hmm. with differences that all of us have, and and that push has been huge. And this happens to be Disability Awareness Month, also, <laughs> Martin <Marches. laughs> yeah. uh, But we have a campaign going on in the high school right now with high school kids. We did it last year, mm -hmm. dealing with the R word and having kids in high school. Um, do some piece of creative art, whether it's writing a poem, a song, a piece of art, whatever they choose to do, that somehow expresses um, positive information about disabilities and, and the R word, and dispelling that R word. But that R word can be very, retard word can be very hurtful mm -hmm. to people with disabilities, and sometimes it's used, I think, flippantly by kids or others, sometimes sure. adults. Um, but there's a piece of pain that comes with it if you're impacted by that part of the world. So a lot has happened yeah. and the, the journey sure. continues. Yeah, sure. exactly. Well, thank you for being here with us today. We really you. appreciate your history. You bet.